G'day, extraordinaires. We are well and truly into our second month of quarantine. Ay, sentences we never thought would leave our mouths. Uh, finally, I kind of think I'm sort of getting the hang of this. Uh, I've got a bit of a routine going on. It seems to be a bit healthy for my brain, which is nice. It was very scattered there for a while. If I could just make some money when I don't actually have a job, I'd be totally sorted. But you know who does have a job? Like one of the most massivest, most seriousest of all jobs are the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare workers. I mean, obviously our uh, food uh, providers and transpo people and all those people in that industry, anyone who's keeping us afloat, God bless you. But today I'm talking about and talking to any and all of the healthcare workers around the globe and especially here in the United States and a big hello and shout out to all my people in Australia. You people, you people, wonderful people are fast becoming our heroes, our army of angels on the front line, rightly so. God bless you, goddess bless you, universe bless you for your tireless work and your sleepless nights and uh, all the time that you spend putting your own lives at risk so that you can have the chance to save ours. It's just kind of beyond me. So from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure all of our hearts, thank you, thank you. Having said that, I hope I never get to see you <laughs> soon at a hospital near me. I hope I never have to come in for any reason uh, at this particular time. Um, but if I do have to come in because I've caught this awful virus or for any other reason, then I'm really, really pleased that I have a good friend of mine, the good doctor, Ross Grant, working his PPE off just up here at one of the, well, I can't say which hospital, but let's just say it's massive and it's really busy. And there's some serious shit going down there right now. These doctors and nurses at this massive hospital are having to see patients out in tents that they've set up in the parking lot. It's, it's grand. I mean, the grief and the danger that he and his fellow doctors and nurses have to face daily is just beyond my comprehension. Uh, Dr. Ross actually contracted COVID-19 about a month ago. And he ended up being admitted to the hospital and being treated by his fellow colleagues. Um, and he was only recently uh, let out and he come good. And of course, he's gone straight back to work and he's on call all the time. And he's working seven days a week and he clearly is an extraordinaire. I'm so grateful. It's late at night. We were supposed to do this hours ago and he has just come home from the hospital, thrown like, I don't know, a cracker down his throat and he's sitting down at the table ready to, to talk and share some of the good news from the good doctor. So I'm really grateful that he loves me like that and he's carved out some time to be a guest on our show and answer your questions because I've gathered a bunch of them from our community because they, they want to know and uh, who better to ask than uh, a doctor. Would you please welcome Dr. Ross Grant. Q applause. Uh, thank you for that kind intro. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I will be your hype girl anytime you need me. How are you? Thank you for, oh, that's my microphone. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. It's good to see you. I might be too uh, happy for the kind of day that you've had. Have you had a, a decent day? How is everything in there today? Um, it was busy, but it was a good day, um, kind of a typical day. Uh, like you said, we usually work seven days in a row, so uh. the weekends are just as busy as the weekdays, so it was pretty busy today on a Saturday. Uh, are you working <laughs> like 14-hour days each time? What kind of rest are you getting, if any? And is it the um, same for you as it if, as if for everyone else? Uh, um, well, I mean, we, we get time off in between, so it's, I don't want to make it sound like I'm working every single day, but we, we work seven days in a row, and then we're off for a few days and then we come back the okay. days are usually about 12 hours long yeah um what i do yeah what was it like there and have you found that you you've all been able to obviously now this has been going on for quite some time but it must have been 
for better words, a bit of a shit show there at the start when this all, you know, flew into town for you. But you've got a, a good routine happening now, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, on the West Coast, we were a little bit, you know, we were lucky in a yeah. sense because we were able to take, you know, and watch what was going on, you know, first in Italy and, and parts of Europe and then in New York and the East Coast. So I think that, you know, the hospitals in California had a lot of time to really prepare for this. And I was, you know, pretty amazed by the way the hospital leadership really ramped things up and changed the way we do a lot of things to prepare for this surge of COVID patients that we knew was coming. And like I said, I mean, we were really lucky to have a little bit of advance notice um, to know that this peak would probably be in, you know, early April. So I think we actually may be at the peak, we hope. But I mean, everything is, you know, we want, we don't want to be I want to be optimistic, but I don't want to be too optimistic. So we're starting to see a bit of a decline, actually, in, in admissions to the hospital lately. And in deaths, too, then, therefore, everything's starting to do the bend the curve? A bit. Yeah, a bit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what's your thoughts, then, on, you know, our fearless leader uh, wanting to open up the country and our what if our governor agrees? Like, what are your thoughts on is that too soon and are we going to really screw it up if we pop open the gates now those are very interesting questions um i try not to get too terribly political about all of that um sure. i will say that i really trust the guidance of i trust people in the cdc and the department of public health uh, because you know, science trust, right so i trust anthony fauci yes uh, what a hero and I, yeah, I, and I trust, I mean, so I really only kind of pay attention to what the scientists and doctors are saying that I see on television. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of nuances to it because I do see the argument that, I mean, the effects on the economy are profound and it's true what people are saying that the risks of keeping things closed for too long have health risks in themselves because, I mean, you know, running out of jobs and losing money and poverty. I mean, that's going to affect people's health in the long run too. So right. it's, they're tough questions. I'm leaving my tags on my shirts just in case I need to return them. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not even joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is going to get dire soon. And I do worry about people's mental health, you know, them being stuck at yeah. home for so long. And, um, you know, depression is, a, is, a, is no joke. Yeah, and in the in the medical community, you know, the people forget. I mean, we're also canceling and de delaying other surgeries and other medical procedures that people need for completely unrelated things having nothing to do with COVID. So that's a big question too, because things are being delayed and postponed and rescheduled to make room in the hospital. And so now there's a big question about when is it safe to start redoing that, you know, or start. Again. Are you delaying these things because of this lack of space, the lack of people, the lack of uh, medicine or PPE, or all of the above? So it's a lot of different reasons. It's it it's sort of initially it was it's mostly to make room in the hospital um, because we had you know models were showing these enormous surges of patients that could come. Now, fortunately, it hasn't been as high of a surge as we were worried it was going to be, but initially. A lot of the delaying those things were literally just to make more bed space in the hospital. But the other part of it is that there's so many contagious patients in the hospital that it becomes da more dangerous and more complicated to do those procedures, both for the surgeons and the staff working on those procedures and the patients themselves. Right. So it's two big reasons. It's kind of to protect the people that would potentially be getting those procedures. And it's also, like you said, to make room and just beds initially right. because, um, you know, we thought we've... We, still may need a ton more room in the hospital than we're used to I across the country. I still can't believe yeah. what's happening. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to be right some days. Um, what is it like? It's not like, um, you know, Grey's Anatomy, right? When you're in there <laughs> or, 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 or is it? It's literally exactly like Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> then I need, I, then all my questions are done. Thanks for joining us. No, yeah. <laughs> Basically just watch that show and you'll, you'll pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> when you are there, what is it like in the ward? Is it stressful? Are you scared? What what, go, what goes on? It's honestly inspiring. I mean, when I, so it was interesting for me because like we might talk about, it, I mean, I, I was sick, so I was out of work for about three and a half, four weeks. You, you know, got one... COVID-19. You were out of work for four weeks and you were serious in trouble, right? But not on a ventilator. Right. 
Right. Yeah. So I was very sick and I was admitted to the hospital and I obviously couldn't go to work for a while. So what was interesting for me was I had this contrast of, you know, working before it all happened and then being sick for a month and then coming back kind of right in the thick of it. And it was amazing to see how much things had changed. Um, Right. Just in terms of, I mean, they put so many policies in place to try to protect everyone, to protect the patients that were there, to protect the visitors, to protect the staff, you know, so even the hospital itself is having a lot of people work from home that can work from home, like people like social workers and, you know, computer technicians and stuff like that. They're also limiting visitors Mm -hmm. to the hospital, which is a big thing just for everybody to keep people safe and do social distancing, even the hospital. So the interesting thing is actually the hospital looks in a way much quieter. Huh. Because there's less people, like extra people around all the time, like visitors, family, staff. Um, so in a sense, it actually has almost this quiet tension to it. Um, mm. And and it's stressful and it's, and, you know, because people don't know what's coming, I think. And it's been, you know, you see so many things on the news that I think people are worried as, you know, what are we going to deal with? What's next week? What's tomorrow? What's next month going to look like? At the same time, it's a very inspiring time to work in healthcare because we're learning new things every single day, and it kind of and it feels like you're, you know, working through history that's going to be written about and talked about for decades. So in that sense, it's a fascinating time to be working, you know, in healthcare in general. Wow. So those were all my thoughts when I came back, as I was just like, "Wow, this is really different. This is a little scary, and this is really interesting." <laughs> Did you know you were going to get it? Did you was it did it seem inevitable to you? Is it inevitable for most of your colleagues or is that mm-hmm. unfair to say? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, I don't think it's I don't think I think people are concerned about it, but I don't think people think it's inevitable. Right. In my right. Per, in my particular case, it was interesting because I got it pretty early, so to be totally honest, it wasn't it was on my radar, but it was sort of like in the news and in the healthcare community, it was really, really ramping up, like right about when I did get it. Right. So I actually almost didn't have time to be worried about getting it. And then I got it. <laughs> I don't know for sure, because I don't know if I can afford the antibody test yet, but I think I had it in mid-February. You probably did. I mean, I have so many friends that have asked me that and I hear their stories and go, you, you honestly probably did. I called my mum before I went to bed to tell her I love her because I wasn't sure I was going to wake up the next morning. Yikes. Yeah. So you were really sick. I was really sick, but I I didn't even know about it at this point. It hadn't even occurred yet. It hadn't even hit. <laughs> but this, it, it is just, this is just like me. I have a terrible respiratory problem, situation all the time. Um, well, I think you're, I think you're right, and I I mean I really think it was probably circulating circulating in the community before it was really on a lot of people's radar. Yeah. So I keep hearing these stories of friends that were sick in like December, January, February. Yeah, you you're like you probably did have it, honestly. Whew. So back to the ward, and this might be my you know my fascination with. I mean, my husband played a doctor on a television show, which I used to. That's where I fell in love with him. He not, let's not tell him that. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> he knows. Um, but what what were do you have a proudest moment and maybe like a you know a, a scariest or a saddest any any you know in, inside story for us? Well, I mean, to me, my proudest moment was how, or my proudest experience in all this was how supportive the other doctors I work with were of me when I was sick. I have to say, I I was, because like I said, I was sort of one of the first people that they all knew that was sick with this and just all of them were checking on me all the time and the infectious disease specialists were talking to me and figuring out what to do and um, so I was just incredibly inspired by how much they checked in on me and how much they were telling me the latest research about everything and what I should be doing. Because, you know, as a patient, as I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing, it's really scary to have this condition that people don't know, that doctors don't know exactly how to treat and exactly how it's going to go. So when I found out I had this, you know, I was scared. And to have the support of a bunch of people that knew that much about it checking on me all the time, that was really inspiring and made me really proud too. I, I love that I asked you about your proudest moment and what you shared was how proud you are of other people. <laughs> well. Yeah, this is why he's a doctor, folks. <laughs> um, I mean, I was proud to be a part of that community. Yeah, of course, I know. I know. This is, this is great. Were you having a lot of trouble breathing? Uh, that, that must be terrifying. Was that how it occurred for you? Um, it started with just kind of a mild dry cough for a few days. And then after about three or four days, I started developing fevers. Yep. Cold Those were, 
uh, chills, chill back and forth. Yeah, yep. chills. I get in bed and be like drenched because I have a blanket on. Yes, and I check my temperature and it was high. And I've never. I mean, I've had flu before and had fevers, yeah. but I've never had fevers like this where I was almost to the point of like hallucinating, like yeah. delirious. Like okay. I had these weird sort of fever dream nightmares. It was bizarre. Wow. And they kept going and going and going off and on for days and days and days. I mean, because even after I knew I had it, I kind of thought, oh, I'll be okay. And I was sort of, you know, being like, oh, I'll just sleep it off. And then it, that just kept going on. That was the worst symptom to me were the fevers. It's shocking. It's a, it's a whole new thing, isn't it? Yeah. It worries and me. And I hate headaches, really bad headaches, really mm-hmm. bad back aches. And really the tired, short, right? really, Yeah, and really, really tired. Really tired. Sleep like 15, 16 yeah. hours a day. Um, the breathing, fortunately, wasn't that bad for me. I had a little bit of shortness of breath later on in the mm-hmm. illness when I got admitted to the hospital. What's your thoughts? What scares me the most is that these asymptomatic people who are, you know, super spreaders, like we can be as sick as you under the surface. Maybe I'm that right now, although I think I already had it. So am I immune? That's another question. Those are all the very good questions that everybody's trying to figure out. You know, I mean, it definitely there is evidence that people can definitely spread it asymptomatically and yep. have been in you know, various countries for yep. months. And that's been proven. Um, so, yeah, that's a problem. I mean, that's what's so interesting and, in a sense, what's so dangerous about this virus and why it's caused so many problems is that it has such a wide spectrum of disease, everything from having no symptoms at all, having kind of a cold symptom type thing, to having pneumonia like I did, to being incredibly sick and being on a ventilator. I mean, that's such a wide spectrum of disease, all from this one virus that can affect any different kind of person from age, you know, 20 to 80. So I think that's why it's been such a challenge. And that's also why it's so, why it has spread so easily is because it can be spread asymptomatically or by somebody that's mildly symptomatic um so the only so answer really is just to stay home that's that's all we have we have to just stay home. <laughs> well I, as you started to ask i mean the antibody question i agree with people on the news and that say that is a game changer potentially okay um which is just starting to ramp up right now um the ability to get really good thorough antibody testing or accu- accurate antibody testing I have a couple of questions actually about that from uh, the community. We have uh, Shell from Germany who wrote in and asked, do you know when the FDA approved antibody test will come out? And what are your thoughts on places like, you know, that Hollywood Clinic Next Health and stuff? They're actually offering like a non FDA approved version. And should we bother with that? Because I think they're about $200, right? Like, do you know when it's coming out? And should we bother doing anything before it's out? Um, my quick answer would be no, I wouldn't bother doing anything before the FDA approved version comes out. And I, it's hard to guess, but I would, I would think maybe in like a month or so okay. is probably when I would, because, you know, they had a lot of, so what's happened in the last couple of weeks is that they had a lot of problems with the tests, like the one you're talking about, I assume. I mean, I don't know specifically that sure. brand, but a lot of these commercially available ones just turned out to be inaccurate, Yeah, which you know, is, is a really dangerous thing and, and is something you don't want to test I mean, use because <laughs> obviously if you get the wrong answer, then that's dangerous and doesn't help you at all. So I would wait until you are getting something that you know is going to be accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of testing going, there is a lot of testing going on right now as we speak last week, this next week. I have friends that are enrolled in trials to really test the actual legitimate tests that are going to be approved by the FDA. Um, I mean, they're trying to do it as fast as possible. It's very logistically complicated. It's hard to know when it's going to be actually available, like from your doctor, but I would guess, in, yeah, I don't know, like three to six weeks, probably. Okay. All right. I mean, I've even got some friends down in Florida who she thinks she, she, thinks she has it, but mm-hmm. has tested negative, like even the COVID-19 tests. Have you been finding that they are coming back incorrectly negative because they're not putting the swab all the way to the back of the nasal cavity where it meets the throat is what she said. Yes. To all that. Um, there is the, the false negative rate is thought to be about 30 to 35%, which is pretty high. So, um, and part of it is like 
because of what you're saying that it's actually a fairly difficult and uncomfortable test to do. So part of it is just, right, people gag and can't handle it. So then maybe they're not getting a great sample. But even if they do get a great sample, the just the nature of the test is that you can get a 30% false negative rate. So like in the hospital, when we really need to 100% know whether people have it, we sometimes test people two or even three times. With different tests? No, with the same test, same but just test. just statistically, you know, if you test it three times, you're much, because if it's, if it's positive, it's positive. But if it's negative, it could be wrong. <laughs> oh, what fun you're having. Right. Oh. All right, we have another question. This is Debbie May from Venice. She said she's heard about a new drug called remdesivir. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be helping patients. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that? So it does look promising. She's talking about remdesivir, Thank which you. has been in the news, um, which has been in the news a lot just in the last two or three days. And the stocks uh, just took the off. The roof. Yeah, I had a bunch of friends calling me asking whether they should invest. In, uh, <laughs> they, uh, it, so you're doing um, stock advice as well? <laughs> yeah. Okay, stay on the call. I got some questions for you at the end. <laughs> um, I, you know, my short answer on that is that. Um, I think it looks promising. I think it does look promising. It's, it's, um, I've been close to some clinical trials that have shown benefit from it. Uh -huh. Um, there's a lot of clinical trials coming out of, you know, Northern California, Southern California, Chicago, some other places. So I think it's looking good. I think people get a little confused though and think it's, it's not a cure. Okay. It's a treatment. So you know, when they do these studies, it helps, you know, it's great because it decreases the amount of people that, die, frankly, or it decreases the amount of people that are on a ventilator. That's the type of thing they look at. Um, but it's not some panacea that we can give to absolutely everybody. And it's going to eradicate the virus, just so people understand. I mean, it's just, it's potentially another weapon in our fight against the virus. But it's not a panacea could be two years away, right? Before it's fully FDA approved, right? That's a long road for well, something like I that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you're referring to a vaccine. Yes. Um, which not to be, you know, negative Nancy, but not even a vaccine is a panacea necessarily, because you have to think that the, um, you know, the flu vaccine that we get every year, yeah. it does not prevent every case of flu. And the vaccine for coronavirus, we don't know yet. I mean, I don't know this for sure, but, you know, there's a chance that it won't be 100% effective either. In okay. fact, I you know, and I'm not a virologist, so don't take my word for this, but there's sure. people that know better than me, but I don't necessarily... I'm not a doctor. Think. You can tell me anything. <laughs> so I can just make stuff up. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I don't think that that... I mean, I and I don't mean to be gloom and doom. Like, I think we'll get a handle on it, and I think in the next certainly year to two years, it's going to look very different in terms of how dangerous it is and how we treat it and things like that. But I don't think it's like one day we're going to have a virus and it's going to be like, bang, we don't have, ever have to worry about this and you're never going to hear about it in the news and let's all go to Coachella. Like, you know, I, oh, think, <laughs> I think it's going to be... my heart. <laughs> I think it's going to be all a combination of all these things helping together, a vaccine, treatments like remdesivir, just doctors better understanding how to treat it in the hospital and getting antibody testing, figuring out how to trace where it's coming from to advise the population on where to go and who to interact with and how to interact with people. I mean, it's all those things together that right. are going to make it not one thing. But we don't need to start because people are like killing bats and things. We don't need to start doing ridiculous things like that. Right. I don't think we need to kill bats. Oh, God, Thank like you. That. Okay. <laughs> Stop it. Uh, Marlena from North Hollywood asks, <laughs> uh, back in the old normal, you know, back before all this, uh, kids obviously would get sick all the time, presumably because they're building their immune systems. She, I'm sure she presumes right, because to them, every virus is novel. So why aren't they getting COVID-19? Why aren't the kids getting COVID-19? Or are they, and they're just asymptomatic little super spreaders trying to kill us all? <laughs> <laughs> so... That's a good question, a complicated question that I honestly don't think the medical community completely understands yet. Um, but in answer to the second part of the question, they are getting it. Uh -huh. They're just not getting as sick from it. Um, so as you're joking, I mean, yes, they could be joking. Little, little asymptomatic spreaders. <laughs> um, We're just trying to keep it light, but, folks. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, honestly, though, I think a lot, I think they're probably getting it 
you know, as often as anybody else. They're just not okay. tending to get sick from it, which is obviously a great thing. Mm-hmm. They're also probably they're also probably less likely to get tested at this point, which means we don't really know the prevalence in kids too. Wow. Um, but my, my, I think from what I've read that that they're getting it probably just as much. They're just not getting sick from it. This is quite a confusing little disease. It's uh, she's she's Trixie. Yeah. Miss <laughs> COVID. Well, I mean, the other thing to think about is that you know they also have less underlying health. Yeah. Conditions. I mean. On a- not all of them, but I mean, the average child has healthier lungs than the average 70 year old. Sure, That's indeed. Good. Yeah. I have one more question from the community. This comes from Austin from Hollywood. Uh, she says, How many patients are you seeing with cardiac issues? Uh, several of her, of her friends are in hospital with COVID and uh, they're suffering from blood clots or tachycardia. So, yeah, that's a good question. So, the, there are definitely cardiac effects from COVID. I'd say the most sort of concerning and prevalent one that we deal with is what she's talking about, which are blood clots, Oof. which um, can be anywhere in the, I mean, the ones that are the most dangerous are pulmonary emboli, which are blood clots in your lungs um, and in the, yeah, in your lungs and the vessels around your heart. And the, um, and then you can also have DDTs like you hear about on, you know, from air, long airplane flights and stuff. You might hear about them that you get in your legs and things like that. So the, the virus makes your blood more likely to clot mm. is what we're finding. Um, I mean, it's not like every patient gets that, but it does increase your risk of it a little bit. So that's being studied aggressively and has definitely been a major complication of, of the very sick people in the hospital. Mm. Um, so that's the main one that I've dealt with and seen and heard about. There's, um, there's other cardiac effects. There's like, it can cause a cardiomyopathy, which is sort of just a broad term for meaning your heart muscle is not functioning as well as it should be. Um, broadly speaking. So, I mean, it does affect directly the heart itself too. Um, but the blood clots in my experience have been a bigger issue than that. Um, and then tachycardia is just a term for a fast heart rate. It certainly causes that, um, sort of any infection can cause that. So that's not really specific to the COVID, but the blood clots are the biggest thing we're seeing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, what are you doing? You obviously deal with this, this stress and, you know, there's a lot of horror that I'm sure that you're seeing, but I've only seen one dead body in my life and I wish that I would never see, have seen that. So you obviously have these wonderful, and you and your colleagues have these wonderful techniques for how you stay positive and stay moving through and stay in the the love of serving and the love of healing, and you kind of sweep everything else away forever, hopefully, right? Do you have tools for how you not have that, nightmares about that shit? <laughs> um, the things that come to mind... Um, I meditate, actually, every day at work. I try to do it every day, sometimes twice a day. There's um, actually a meditation chapel in our hospital. Ooh. So, um, when I take breaks, I, I tend to turn off my phone for 10 minutes and meditate. I try to do it every day, sometimes twice a day. Um, so that's very helpful. I also think, you know, the other thing that comes to mind is just the the camaraderie of the people that you're working with is really it's just a really supportive environment, especially now, I think, because I think everybody is feeling like, you know, wow, this is history we're living through and we're all incredibly proud to be on the front lines of trying to help people as much as we can. So I think just everybody's incredibly supportive. Mm. I think the sort of, you know, little bickering and things that might have gone on a year ago when I was at work are not happening as much now. Mm. <laughs> so I think that um, makes it, makes it, you know, makes it better for lack of a (laughs) more uh, better way to say that. But I think it just, I feel supported and I feel like everybody's looking out for each other at work. So I think those things are really helpful. And then, you know, when I get home from work, I usually play guitar. I play guitar in the morning and I play guitar when I get home. So that helps me. (laughs) So this is like turn off that part of my brain and turn on the other part of my brain, which is very helpful. Yeah. When Dr. Ross says play guitar, he's not going twang, twang, twang. No, (laughs) Dr. Ross had a recording contract at age 21. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine crowned his band, Pseudopod, uh, the best college band. And the part that I just had no idea about you before and just, just, just fills my heart with so much love is that the, the lead singer from the band Pseudopod, because that's what you were doing. Your trajectory was music. You mm-hmm. earned a scholarship to UCLA 
and he mm-hmm. graduated magna cum laude, whatever that means in Australia. I don't even know what that means. It means you're bloody good at school, mate. <laughs> but then your lead singer of the band died of brain cancer and that's why you decided to go to medical school and yeah. become a doctor because apparently you can do everything, Dr. Ross. Well, thank you. I um, Yeah, that was a profound part of my 20s for sure, though. Yeah, our lead singer got diagnosed with brain cancer when he was 25. Uh, completely out of where, just got a headache while we were on tour in Colorado, and they found a mass in his brain. And he ended up surviving for a couple of years, but he died before he was 30. So, yeah, so it was definitely an incredibly formative part of my life. Um, I had been thinking about going to medical school before that, too, but that definitely made me take it really seriously again in my mid twenties. And then I started med school uh, a little bit after that. Wow. That is so cool. If only I had a brain like yours. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you're doing such great things with it. Do you, before we let you go, is there anything that you want to share with, you know, Californians with our, you know, fellow Los Angeles, anything that's coming from, you know, your standpoint that you can inspire us or advise us or, you know, give us some kind well, of... Well, the biggest thing I would want to say is just thank you to everybody in California. I think that, you know, we really did flatten the curve. And I think the social distancing things and these really difficult closures of bars and restaurants and and work really did make a difference. Because like I said at the beginning of this, you know, the peak and the surge that we're really in right now is way less than we were worried it was going to be which was an amazing thing and a lot i think we all saved a lot of lives by really taking this seriously from our mayor and our governor and and all the people that live in our state um so i would just say thank you i think it's going to be tough to know exactly how the next couple of weeks and months and even maybe a year or so is going to look and i think the information is going to be changing all the time so I guess if I had any advice, I would just say you have to be patient with things changing because I think that the advice you're going to hear is going to change. And it's that's a scary way to live because people want to know what's going to happen next week and next month. But I don't know, Yeah, frankly. <sighs> Breathe and meditate. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I don't want to say it again, but I'm like, just stay present. That's what you can do. And if you see Dr. Ross at a bar... Buy that man a drink. <laughs> yeah, you... when they're open again. <laughs> yeah, wait. Okay, sorry. Yeah, of course. <laughs> if we ever, ever get to buy someone a drink at an actual bar again and you see this handsome man, he is a doctor saving lives. And if you ever see the band The Hundred Year War listed anywhere, that's him. Go and pay some money and check it out. And I'm so happy that I know someone doing such great things in the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much to Dr. Ross Grant. Thank you so much to you, our subscribers. Thank you for watching us on YouTube, the Teresa Livingston YouTube channel. Thank you so much for subscribing to Extraordinaire's podcast. We're slowly growing. Thank you to my husband, of course. He's outside doing the these lovely lights and all the sound and, and all the stuff. Cheers to you, my love. And, um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> three cheers, hip, hip. Uh, Stay well, stay safe, uh, take care of your loved ones, reach out to people who need support and a hand. No more time is more inspiring now to be of service. So uh, dig deep and see how you can help your neighbor or um, anyone for that matter. We're all in this together. Take care. Bye. Extraordinary.